Konnichiwa. Today, we're going to talk about the number one secret of Japanese. This is the secret that will make the difference between trying to understand Japanese as a vague, fuzzy, magical language in which every sentence is a kind of guessing game and having a solid, clear, logical grasp on that language and its structure so that you know in every sentence exactly what's going on. Now this secret is something that the schools and textbooks don't teach you. But they do more than just not teach you. They do everything possible to prevent you from guessing it for yourself. Now, why would they do that? I'm not talking about some kind of conspiracy here. I'm talking about the fact that the way of describing and constructing the language is fundamentally flawed. Why is it flawed? Well, I think we're really getting into an area here that goes beyond grammar. It's an almost philosophical question. Japanese and English have very different world outlook. In some ways, they are diametrically opposed. English is a very egocentric language, and this isn't some kind of a moral statement. I'm talking about grammar. English wants to have an ego as the main actor, the center of every sentence, if it possibly can. Preferably me, if not me, then someone else, and if not a person, then at least an animal. It has to be some kind of ego actor. Japanese doesn't work like that at all. It's very happy to have non-sentient beings as the main actor of a sentence. You might call this a more animist way of looking at language. Now, this may sound rather abstract, but it's not abstract at all. Let's get into some concrete examples. I'm going to begin with my favorite example, and if you've heard it before, don't go away, because we're going much deeper this time. My favorite example is Watashi wa kohi ga suki da. Now, we can have the Watashi or we can not have it. It will be understood whether we say it or not. What the textbooks and the schools and everybody else tells you is that this means I like coffee. And I like coffee may well be what we would say in English if we wanted to say something similar. But it's not what this sentence means. And if you followed the course up to this point, you can see why it isn't. The first and most important point here is, look where the ga is. The ga is marking the coffee. We know that the main actor, the doer or the bear of a sentence is always marked by ga. So we know that the main actor of this sentence is not Watashi, I, it is the coffee, which is marked by ga. Watashi could have an invisible ga after it, but in this case it can't, because we already know what the ga is, it's the coffee. So the coffee is being or doing something. In English we're told that it's a A does B sentence, but we only have to look at it to see that it isn't. It ends with da. It's an A is B sentence, isn't it? The coffee is ski. So what does ski mean? Ski is a noun. And it's one of those adjectival nouns that we've talked about before. So it's telling us something about the nature or condition of the coffee. In this case, what it's telling us is that the coffee is pleasing. That's the core of the sentence. Coffee is pleasing. The watashi wa, implicit or explicit, is telling us in whose case it is pleasing. As for me, coffee is pleasing. Now, this is very, very, very important, because if we don't know that, if we really believe that this sentence means I like coffee, our grasp of ga and wo is completely messed up. If the actor of this sentence was Watashi, it would have to be marked by ga. If the thing that the actor was acting upon by liking it was the coffee, then it would have to be marked by wo. So we have two particles, and two most fundamental particles, completely confused in our minds. We now believe that sometimes ga can mark the object of the sentence instead of the subject, the thing acted upon instead of the bear or doer of the sentence. And we now believe that the object of the sentence, the thing that's being acted on, can sometimes be marked by ga instead of wo. And none of this is true. It never can. That can never happen. And if that could happen, Japanese would become chaos, and that's exactly what it does become in the minds of many students. So as we see in this sentence, 
Audacity is the non-logical topic of the sentence marked by Y. It's not the actor. It's not the subject. Coffee is not the object which would be marked by O if it was. It is the subject. And ski is not a verb meaning to like. It's an adjective meaning to be pleasing. So every single word in this sentence is being misdescribed by the standard explanation. And this kind of misunderstanding throws Japanese into complete chaos. Now, are there many cases like this in Japanese? Well, frankly, it doesn't matter if there are many or not. Once your understanding of the particles is messed up, it's messed up. But, as it happens, there are a lot. All kinds of different sentence structures in Japanese show up this same misunderstanding. For example, if we say, Hon ga wakaru, or watashi wa hon ga wakaru, we are saying, the book is understandable. But the English text tell you that this means, I understand the book. And in this case, it's even less forgivable, because there isn't really an equivalent to ski in English, but there is an equivalent to wakaru. It means understandable or clear. We could say, in relation to me or just to me, the book is understandable. And then we wouldn't be completely messing up what ga does, or thinking that a noun that should be marked by wo can be marked by ga at random. So why, at least in this case, don't the schools and textbooks simply translate it as it really is? To me, the book is understandable. Speaking of me, the book is understandable. Because this prejudice for putting an ego at the center of every sentence is so strong that it takes precedence over learning Japanese correctly. And these are not just a few random cases. Later on, we're going to look at the potential form and we're going to look at the receptive form, which is misdescribed as passive. And both of them are going to throw up forms of this same problem. Since they are both fairly large subjects in themselves, I'm not going to talk about them now. But let's talk about the way we desire things in Japanese. Let's talk about how Japanese handles desire. Whether we want something or want to do something. How do we talk about this in Japanese? Well, suppose we want something. Let's say, Koneko ga oshi. Koneko is a kitten. Ko is child or small thing, and neko is cat. And hoshi is translated in English as want. Now, if you look at it, the first thing you can see is that it's not a verb. It's an adjective. It ends in e, not in u. And the second thing you can see, which is the most important, is that the ga marked actor of this sentence is not me who wants the cat. It's the cat who is wanted. So, what does hoshi mean? Well, quite simply, it means who is wanted. In relation to me, a cat is wanted. And again, if we seriously believe that this means I want a cat, we are thinking that the ga can mark the object of a sentence, the object of the action, the thing we're doing it to. So again, we're being confused about the role ga plays in a sentence. We're confused about the role wo plays in a sentence because the cat should be marked by wo if it meant I want a cat, and we confused between verbs and adjectives. So again, Japanese just becomes a strange guessing game in which particles and kinds of word can change their meaning at random. Now, suppose you want to do something. In Japanese, we express wanting to do something differently from the way we express wanting to have something. And the way we do it is by using the E stem again. The stem, as I, as I told you before, is a very important stem. So, in order to say we want something, we have to add the want adjective, which is tai. So we now have an adjective. And what does this adjective mean? It doesn't mean want in the English sense. It can't, because want is a verb. And tai, it means e, is an adjective, isn't it? So let's take an example. This is a slightly notorious example. Crepe ga tabetai. Now, the standard English translation of this is I want to eat crepes. But as you see, the pattern here is just the same as in the other cases we've been considering. The ga marked actor is not watashi, it's not me, it's the crepes. The desirability of the crepes is not a verb, it's an adjective. And we need to understand this because if we don't, it's not just going to mess up this 
kind of sentence that's going to mess up our whole grasp of Japanese words, Japanese particles, and Japanese structure. Now, there's no really good way of translating this into English. We would have to say something like, in relation to me, crepes are desire-inducing. And that's very awkward. And sometimes people ask me, am I really supposed to use all these awkward literal translations that you give rather than using natural English? And the answer to that is no. You're not supposed to be thinking in terms of my awkward explanations or thinking in terms of natural English. You're supposed to be thinking of Japanese in terms of, guess what, Japanese. I am explaining it in English to give you a start toward doing that. But these unnatural translations or explanations are there to help you grasp the structure of Japanese, not to give you a way of translating Japanese. Now, as I say, the pattern is the same in all these cases, and I don't think it's very difficult to grasp. It may take you a little while to adjust your mind to the more animist way of thinking, and to do that, you may want to watch this video two or three times more to get it fixed in your head. But it isn't inherently difficult. I think you will agree. But now, we're going to look at something which could seem a little confusing, and I promise you it isn't if you just follow carefully what I'm going to say. We have this sentence here, crepe ga tabetai, but what if we didn't have the crepes here? What if we just said tabetai? Now there's no longer in this sentence what English wants to call the object of desire, and what is in fact the subject of desire, the desire inducer, and obviously there has to be a ga marked zero car, or, as you know, we don't have a sentence. But what is that zero ka in this case? Well, the ironic thing is that in this case, the zero car is what the English textbooks thought it was all along. It's I. I really am the actor of the sentence this time. And that may be part of the reason for a lot of the confusion that happens on this subject. Watashi ga tabetai means I want to eat. I don't want to eat crepes necessarily or sakura or bento necessarily. I just want to eat. And because there is no eat-inducing subject here, the want to eat is attributed directly to me. And you may be asking, you should be asking, so what is this Thai? Is it an adjective describing the condition of something making me want to do something? Or is it an adjective describing my desire? And the answer is that it can be either. Obviously, when it is describing the cake, it's also indirectly describing my feelings about the cake. It's describing the feelings the cake induces in me. And when there's no cake there, or no crepe there, or no sakura or bento there, we just describe my feelings directly. And this is often the case in Japanese with adjectives of desire. For example, kawaii, which means either scared or scary. If I say obake ga kawaii, I'm saying ghosts are scary. But if I say just kawaii, I'm saying I am scared. Now, is this confusing? It isn't confusing because we have a landmark that tells us what to do every time. And that landmark is ga. In these sentences, and in much, much more complicated sentences, if we watch the ga and watch the other logical particles, we'll never go wrong. Because the logical particles never, ever, ever change their function. So we can use them as our compass. And that's why it's so very destructive to induce people to believe that they can change their function, as the textbooks do. If you have a compass and I say to you, ah, well, most of the time the compass points north, but sometimes it points south, and actually quite a lot of the time it also points east, you might as well not have a compass. I have destroyed the value of your compass for you. And it's the same with the logical particles. They are absolutely reliable. They always point north. They never change their function. So, 
If Gal Marx craves, then we know that the subject of the sentence, the thing about which the engine is telling us, is the craves, nothing else. But if we don't have the Gal Marx subject there, we know that by default the zero pronoun is usually I, unless there's a reason to think it's something else. It's just the same as in the ill example that we gave in the lesson on wa. Now I'm going to tell you one more thing, and I hope I'm not overloading you with information in this lesson, but it will have the advantage of giving you even more confidence about what the zero pronoun is in these cases. And that is that you cannot use these adjectives of desire or feeling about anyone but yourself. So if I say tabetai and there is nothing to tabetai in the sentence or the context, then I must be talking about me. I can't be talking about you and I can't be talking about Sakura. Why not? Because Japanese doesn't permit us to do that. You can't use tai about someone else or kowai or hoshi. You can't use any of these things about someone else. What if we want to say that someone else wants something? Well, because Japanese is a very logical language, it does not allow us to make definite statements about something we can't know for sure. So you see, it's very different from Western languages. One thing we can't know for sure is someone else's inner feelings. So I might think that Sakura wants to eat cake, but I don't know that. All I know is how she's acting. I know what she says. I know what she does. I know how she looks, but I don't know what her inner feelings are. So if I want to talk about her desire to eat cake, I can't use Thai. And I can't use kawaii to describe her fear. And I can't use hoshi to describe a thing she might want. So what do I do? I have to add to the adjective of desire a helper verb. I take the e of the e adjective and I add the helper verb garu. And garu means to show signs of, to look as if it is the case. So if I say Sakura ga keiki wo hoshigaru. Then I'm saying, Sakura is showing signs of wanting cake. That's what I'm literally saying. And even if she's actually told me she wants cake, that's still what I say because I can't feel her feelings. I only know what she's doing and saying. Now why do we use a verb in the case of other people when it's an adjective in the case of ourselves? Again, this is very logical. I can't describe someone else's feelings because I can't feel them, I don't know about them. I can only speak of their actions, and their actions obviously must be a verb. So this is a useful thing to know, but it also helps us to be very clear when we say tabetai or anything else, tai or anything, hoshi, that if there is not a cause of that emotion, then the zero pronoun must be me or tashi, because it can't be anybody else. You actually can't use it for anybody else. So that's quite a lot of information in one lesson. But understanding this is going to shortcut you right through a huge area of confusion and misunderstanding that troubles many Japanese learners for years. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comments below and I will answer. And if you'd like to join our learning community, please take a look at my Patreon. We always have something going on there. I'd like to thank my Gold Kokeshi Producer Angel patrons who make these videos possible. And I'd like to thank all my patrons and supporters. And I'd like to thank you too for attending this lesson. Kore kara mo. Yoroshiku Class dismissed.